They're going to tell me when we're actually live. Okay, it's a bit of a delay. We're good, we're live. Thanks for uh, joining us uh, this uh, afternoon. Um, for my sake, uh, just uh, because I'm technologically illiterate at times, I am not seeing our feed yet. So <laughs> we're not live, right? you're not live in front of me, but we'll make sure that, uh, that that happens. There you go. Uh, so uh, we're uh, live this afternoon with uh, New York State Comptroller, uh, Tom DiNapoli. Tom uh, and I uh, served with each other, in fact, I. Uh, I first met Tom DiNapoli when I was an intern for New York State Assemblywoman Eileen Hickey uh, mm -hmm. in 1992. And, um, uh, Tom, of course, serves as uh, the 54th Comptroller of the State of New York, uh, uh, having served in the New York State Assembly for uh, a number of years, what, uh, 90, I'm told 98 to 2000, or excuse me, 87 to 2007. And uh, we were just uh, commiserating before going live that Tom uh, has a long history of public service um, and uh, beginning as a school board member at the age of 18, officially uh, a couple months younger than I was when I was first elected to the Village Board of Trustees as an 18-year-old in Tivoli, New York. Thank you, Tom, for joining us. Mark, it's great to be with you as always, uh, even during the challenging times we're, we're going through. And uh, as you indicated, we've enjoyed a uh, a long-term uh, partnership on many issues and, and great to have our public service uh, overlapping and uh, I'm just very uh, proud of the job you're doing as county executive during uh, you know, really a time of crisis. And I know, you know, obviously, as we all know, you've been touched personally by the COVID-19 pandemic and yet uh, you haven't stopped uh, being there not only for your own family, but for all the families of Dutchess County, working closely with your team and all the elected officials in the county you're on the front lines and uh, this vehicle that you've done with others communicating in every way that you can with your constituents really is an important service and just thank you for inviting me to be part of uh, today's discussion. Well, I, I appreciate that and, and thanks, Tom. I, I, we, we often uh, kind of uh, always say as government officials that uh, we're making uh, some of our financial decisions to prepare for the rainy day. Uh, well, uh, it's uh, more of a torrential uh, downpour at the moment, yeah. and uh, you know probably better than most uh, uh, from your view uh, the challenges that are going to face uh, the state of New York financially, but also, of course, how that either trickles down or does, in fact, impact local government. So uh, I appreciate that. I'm, we're going to jump in. I'm going to remind folks uh, as you're watching uh, this afternoon, if you have a question, just simply add uh, your question to the comment box below uh, the live stream, and we'll try to get to as many uh, as we can today. Um, Tom, you know that county governments, uh, as you mentioned, are on the front line of responding to the pandemic. Um, you know, when, when, when presidents, governors, and even city mayors need uh, the public health response, it is, in fact, county governments across the country, uh, including one very large county government, the city of New York, uh, that's responsible for uh, implementing uh, the pandemic response. In fact, we're, we're responsible for over 1,900 public health departments across America. And over a thousand hospitals are administered by county governments. So, uh, you know as well as anybody that that we're uh, on the on the front line. Um, I think uh, um, uh, you, you you recognize, and, and we'll we'll jump in as soon as we get a couple of questions. Uh, that uh, uh, Dutchess County government's not alone uh, in in feeling this uh, the, the the pressure that uh, financial pressure that we're we're now feeling. Uh, our financial team has been evaluating uh, the impact from, from lost sales tax, and perhaps you want to jump into that a little bit. Uh, but the uh, uh, lost sales tax, uh, which we expect uh, could impact us uh, as much as uh, $50 million worth of revenue loss, uh, plus some, some additional revenue streams that, that we, we expect will dry up, and, and, and of course, uh, uh, some new expenditures that may or may not be met by federal assistance. And uh, I know that you've been uh, vocal, uh, vocal in this, uh, the federal government has to uh, uh, do its part to assist the state and local governments in responding. It, it may bicker, it may, um, you know, sometimes point the political finger, but never before has the federal government abandoned its states and local governments in time of crisis, and this should not be that that time uh, for setting some new precedent. Uh, but with that, why don't why don't you give us a, a brief overview of what you see from from uh, sure from your your office? And yeah, yeah. Might impact us locally. Go ahead. Sure. Let me let me touch on a few different uh, topics, Mark, and I'll try try to do it uh, efficiently and leave Go ahead. time for questions. So, uh, also, you know, just before you and I went live, I do want to acknowledge to uh, your audience uh, the loss of Barbara Jeter Jackson, uh, 
you know, certainly a good friend and colleague of yours and a great representative for your county. So uh, we think of her and uh, my thoughts and prayers are certainly with her family. And, uh, you know, certainly want to acknowledge the incredible work of uh, all the frontline workers, not only those that work for county and local government, but obviously those in the healthcare field. I mean, you know, the doctors, the nurses, all the medical personnel, you know, really dealing with this incredible uh, challenge that really came out of the blue. And I know last week we had uh, National EMS Re Recognition Week. So again, we thank all the emergency responders. In your county, I think you're up to 139 deaths. Uh, any one death uh, is a loss. And I, I guess you're a little over 3,800 uh, cases. So certainly Duchess has not been left out of, of the public health challenge. Uh, and you know that really, I think, as we move forward with the reopening, we do have to keep in mind the public health uh, dimension of all of this and reopen in a safe way we certainly don't want to go backwards in terms of reinfection. But that being said, the reopening is important because, you know, as you alluded to, the impact on the economy and then by extension on government and the ability of government to deliver services in the midst of this pandemic is very much tied to our ability to reopen the economy and obviously to leverage the appropriate uh, support. So I guess on Tuesday, uh, your region uh, started the, the phase one of reopening. You know, the governor has laid out uh, the regional plan and the metrics that have to be met. So, you know, that's welcome news. Uh, my home community of Long Island uh, had the first uh, day yesterday of reopening. So it's really uh, down to New York City, where obviously they, you know, they have some significant challenges they still uh, have to work with. So, uh, you know, what's been the impact? What's driving our concern? You know, we've all been looking at the numbers nationally and statewide, even the updated numbers today about people applying for unemployment. Uh, we saw in the, uh, April numbers, uh, incredible uh, loss of jobs across uh, the country, 14.7% unemployment rate, 20.5 million jobs lost nationally, virtually all the job gains of the past decade wiped out. And so here in New York, we haven't been left out of that challenge. And to the extent that New York is in many ways the epicenter for the pandemic, we've certainly been hit. Unemployment for April uh, up uh, to 14.5%. Uh, loss of private sector jobs over 1.7 million in Dutchess Putnam area, almost 22,000 jobs lost year over year, April uh, to April. Uh, in, the, in the census survey, 53% of New York households have experienced a loss of employment income since March 13th. Maybe not losing the job totally, but losing employment income. Uh, and, and you mentioned uh, the sales tax uh, numbers. You know, we look at that pretty carefully. Uh, very important revenue source for the state, more, more important revenue source for you at the county level. And it was interesting for the first quarter, we usually do quarterly reporting on sales tax revenue. And, and sales tax was down, you know, about 4.6%. Uh, uh, and it, I, I'm sorry, they were actually up 4.6% by March 31st. And I said to the team, I said, you know, we're putting this out in April. It doesn't mean anything because, you know, January, February, first two weeks of March, we're nothing like what we're going through now. Uh, what's, what's important about those numbers is not that there was still a net increase for the first quarter. The last two weeks of, of March, uh, Mark, just as a, as a point of reference, New York City, which often leads the state in sales tax collections, they dropped 12% just in the last two weeks of, of March. So when we went into the April numbers, we decided it would be valuable to put out monthly sales tax reports to help you and local officials understand what's going on. So for April, sales tax down statewide 24.4%. I mean, that's a huge hit for Dutchess County, even uh, more of a hit, minus 27%. Every region of the state saw their tax collections on sales tax go down. Uh, again, a big hit for the state, even bigger hit for our localities. You, I could go through other numbers on tax data, but suffice it to say, it puts us with the state in a position of having a budget gap of about 13.3% billion dollars because of the economy being on hold. Also the delay in the filing for income taxes to uh, July 15th. Uh, obviously we would normally be getting in a significant influx of tax revenue that's been put off to help people navigate this tough time. And you know, May and June particularly are big payout months uh, at the state level, especially for big ticket items like school aid. You know, so it, it, it's a real challenge and you look at the out year budget gaps you know, conservatively, we're talking about out year gaps totaling about uh, 25, 26 billion dollars. So it's not just a 2020 fiscal year problem. It's going to be with us for a period of time. You know, so are there any bright spots right now? Well, the state has gotten five, about 5.1 billion 
of the coronavirus relief fund money. That money has not all been spent down yet because we are working with Treasury to clarify what the money could be spent on. But what's key to you and your, your colleagues at the local government level is, as you know, with the state budget that was put together, it was basically a placeholder budget. And, and the numbers were there, but the, the governor, through the division of budget, was given extraordinary powers to adjust the budget downward if the revenue doesn't come in. Also, extraordinary powers to borrow beyond uh, the usual limits. And the trigger point, there are three trigger points, three dates within the fiscal year uh, where the governor can uh, utilize those powers. The first being the uh, what we call the May 15th cash report that my office, the Comptroller's Office, puts out that showed that our state revenues were off by about 68, close to 70 percent year over year. So certainly we're in a position now where we can be faced with those cuts. What did the governor outline in terms of broad parameters? 8.2 billion in cuts in local assistance. That's aid to Dutchess County, school districts, uh, villages, cities, and so on, towns, and 1.6 billion uh, in cuts to state agencies. So we haven't seen those cuts yet. Uh, they could be as much as 20%. We have seen reduction in Medicaid reimbursement though as part of the Medicaid redesign team. What does it really come down to? It's what you know you touched on, the need for more support uh, from Washington. As you know, the governor met with the president yesterday talking about some of these issues and, and money for infrastructure. Uh, Mark, I appreciate your role uh, in speaking out on this so that we in New York can have a bipartisan position that we need more help from Washington. We appreciate the help so far, but uh, clearly the, the, the next piece has to be to plug the budget hole at the state level because if we don't plug the budget hole at the state level, it'll be cuts that will then transfer the problem to the local level. And separate from that, even if the state assistance that you've been counting on comes through, you've got your own revenue losses, not just on sales tax, but you know all the other kinds of economic activity that's on hold. Uh, you've probably got some folks in the county that may have a hard time paying their property taxes. That's gonna be a revenue hit. You just go down a long list. So uh, the governor and, and, and you and, and myself and others, we've been saying, the additional help from Washington has to be in the form of unrestricted aid, not just to the state and not just New York, obviously all states, but also has to be unrestricted aid to our localities as well. Um, we'll see where it goes. You know, the House passed a version. We certainly hope that there will be uh, continued discussions. We need a bipartisan response, but timing is important. If we don't get this additional relief, whatever the number will be, you know, the governor's asked for 61 billion over multiple years, uh, and, and that and then some was in the House bill. But the timing becomes key. If we don't get the money soon, I don't have a drop dead date, but if we don't get it soon, you will see the budget cuts that the governor outlined. So uh, I, from my point of view, uh, county executive, we can't just cut our way out of this because the cuts would be too severe. We can't just borrow our way out of it because the worst thing would be to in debt future taxpayers uh, with deficit financing. Some folks talk about raising taxes. I don't know that now's the best time to have that kind of discussion with the economy in the shape that it's in. It really does come back to the Washington piece. Let me mention quickly a couple of other things that get to your questions. You know, people ask me about the pension fund. You know, what's happening with that? So um, the New York State and local retirement system that I'm the trustee for, uh, we go into this challenging time as one of the best funded pension plans in the country. 96% funded at, at our last calculation. That being said, March 31st, the end of the fiscal year, is when we value our fund. It wasn't a great day to value the fund. I don't have to tell you that. Mm -hmm. the markets bounced back a little bit from mid-March, but you know certainly the bounce back we've seen lately, we didn't experience on March 31st. So we're gonna have a negative number. We don't have the final number yet because this is the key number that goes into the employer contribution rate. So we're waiting to get the final audited number. But I just wanna say a couple of things for those who are listening, who are members of the system. Again, we went into this well-funded. Uh, we'll take a slight hit and, and not all of our money is in the stock market. So, you know, we have the strength from a diversified portfolio, but because we're well-funded, there is no jeopardy on retirement benefits. We have plenty of liquidity and cash on hand to pay benefits. And even for those who are thinking of retiring in the near future, not to worry. In terms of context, 10 years ago when the great recession hit, we lost a 26% value of the fund in one year when the markets tanked. The loss we're gonna have this year will be nowhere near that. It'll, it'll be a much smaller loss. And when we did, for you, Mark, and to your colleagues in local government, when we do the calculation for the employer contribution rate, the bill we're gonna send you, 
it will go up. I don't doubt that for, for 2022. But we, we smooth our investment return over a five-year period. So even if we have one year of negative, we have four years before that of positive. So I don't want to you know, paint a picture that's going to be a, a dire consequence. It, it, will it have an impact? Absolutely. I don't want to say that it won't. Uh, but I also want to point out that um, we've been working with the legislature. In fact, they've, they're finalizing. Uh, there was a, an amendment today when we're talking about the pension fund. Obviously, some of our members uh, have been inf- uh, impacted by COVID-19. They've been infected. And unfortunately, in some cases, have, have lost their lives. So uh, the legislature and the governor and working with our office, uh, they are providing an enhanced benefit for anyone uh, who would have... Uh, uh, come down with the disease and lost their life to give their survivors uh, a better benefit option than they would have had under existing law. So that bill actually is, is being finalized today. There should be a vote today or tomorrow. And certainly folks could be in touch with our office and we'd be happy to give them more information if, God forbid, they have to access those enhanced benefits. You know, I'll just wrap up by saying we are uh, continuing our work. Most of our folks are working remotely, but we're approving contracts and payments and payroll sending out pension checks. We're working with the Department of Labor to get the unemployment payments out. You know, that's been an issue nationally, and we've had a backlog in New York, given how many folks have uh, been applying for it. Um, We also, uh, and Mark, this should be of interest uh, to you and your colleagues in NISAC, the Association of Counties, work with uh, another friend of yours, Elliot Auerbach, who heads our uh, Division for Local Government and School Accountability. Just passed today, uh, we work, they worked on a program bill that we put forward to provide some flexibility for our local governments and school districts in response to the emergency. Uh, there are several provisions in the bill that would extend repayment terms for bond anticipation notes. Uh, it gives more time for those bands. I know that's been an issue of concern. More flexibility to redirect the use of reserve funds. You know, m- many localities and school districts have reserve funds that are dedicated for one purpose. They may not need that money for that purpose anymore. We want to make it more flexible for that money to be used for the emergency situation we're going through and more time to repay interfund advances. We work with uh, the Association of Counties and the other uh, municipal uh, and school board groups to come up with that uh, proposal. And I'm glad passed both houses today. And I certainly anticipate the governor is going to sign it. Uh, I would encourage uh, all of those listening and viewing, go to our website www.osc.state.ny.us. Just you don't have to remember that. Just put in New York State Controller on your search engine. We have a COVID-19 survival toolkit, a lot of useful information for small business, for local government, for retirees, for public workers. We also have information on there. We've been teaming with an organization that we've worked with for many years, formerly called the New York Business Development Corporation, now called Pursuit Lending. And they have a small business lending program. It's 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 has a backstop from the federal uh, PPP, but it's not the federal PPP. It's another option for uh, small businesses, and in this case, for nonprofits as well. 501c3s that may have a need for uh, additional uh, uh, capital. Uh, so, for information on that, go to our website, or you could just go to Pursuit Lending spelled out dot com and get information on that. Their number is 866-466-9232. And of course, um, Mark, as you know, we always like to remind everybody about unclaimed funds, right? Lost money, old bank accounts, healthcare checks that weren't cashed. Uh, When that money is declared dormant, gets turned over to my office. We have accounts for Dutchess County, over 100,000, valued at over $46 million. So if folks are, in the privacy of their home, uh, self-quarantined, it's a good time to go to our website and uh, click on unclaimed funds. You can search online, apply online, and get the money if there's a match pretty quickly. We also tell people, put in your business, put in your church, your synagogue, your mosque, any nonprofit group. Deceased relatives as well, accounts may be in their names. We might need more, more backup information to prove that you're the heir, but we want to return some of that money to the Dutchess County people who are in those accounts. We also have, in addition to the website, an 800 number that operates Monday through Friday, business hours, 1-800-221-9311. And I'll just wrap up by saying that with all the challenges, I have tremendous confidence uh, we're gonna get through this tough time. And certainly, uh, Mark, having very dedicated county officials like yourself leading the way on a regional basis, that gives me confidence as well. It's important we all work together 
You know Matt Martini from my office, our Hudson Valley rep. He's there to help you and your team or, or any of your colleagues who may be listening may have a local government issue. You know, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to Matt, and we certainly are there to work with you. So, you know, I, I, I hope I did that fast enough. I hope I didn't throw too much out there, but um, be happy to take any, any questions that, that you may have. Thanks, Tom. And I, uh, we do have a few questions lined up. You, you did address uh, Bill, uh, who uh, is a New York State employee, he had a question regarding the security of the pension uh, fund. You, you kind of uh, did certainly address that. I, um, you know, uh, you explained the unclaimed funds. I just want to remind people, um, uh, I, I think the average person doesn't necessarily know you, you do that, right? So that uh, they should visit your, the website. They should, in your own time now, in, input your information. You might find right. Uh, that there's unclaimed funds uh, for you. I think uh, you gave me five dollars and seventy-six cents a year ago, or something of that nature. And you were worth every penny of it. <laughs> well, you get, as they say around here, you get what you pay for. Um, um, but you know, but it's it's interesting. Most of the most of the recoveries there, Mark, I think, as you know, usually fifty to a hundred dollars. But it's not unusual for it to be a few hundred or even a few thousand. So uh, you know, it's always nice when someone gets a pleasant surprise that they that they didn't realize they were in our system because. You know, very often it's an old bank account. Someone moved. They didn't keep up the contact information. And I did want to emphasize the point that, it, you know, it, it could be in the name of a deceased relative. We have a lot of accounts uh, in that category, and people don't realize as long as they could show their connection to the account, we can return the money. And there's no fee. There's no charge. Sometimes people are contacted by a business that will take 15% to get the money for you. Come to us directly. There's no charge on this. We want you to get 100%. Sure. So a number of people have asked, and and I know that you you watch the. I mean, obviously you, you pay attention to the the public debate. Um, you know, the question about New York's fiscal condition before COVID, and whether or not we're asking the federal government to kind of bail us out from perhaps any 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 difficulties or stress we had prior to, to coming into this. Mm -hmm. You want to help people navigate. One, I, I'll say up front, it, it was at the end of the day. Uh, yes, there needs to be accountability, but there is a real financial crisis facing the state of New York and local governments and other states across the country because of the pandemic and our response to it. It is, as, as, as I've said, uh, and we all know, emergency response starts at the local level. And when, uh, when the, the demand exceeds capacity, we move to the next level of government. Uh, well, the demand has exceeded the capacity of any one state to respond, and therefore the federal government steps in. It, it's what it does. Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about that? Yeah. As you know, that's a that's an open debate, and I think it's a good question. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, I'll, I'll answer it a couple ways. First of all, you know, one of the big uh, questions that keeps coming up uh, in the criticism is that, uh, you know, uh, we shouldn't be bailing out pension funds. So, because the state of Illinois, apparently they did say we want help on our pension, but Illinois has, I think, the worst funded pension system in the country. So, you know, and even some of the national tweets that were out, they were criticizing New York for that. And I answered it very directly. We are not asking for any help for the pension fund. Our pension fund has been in good shape for a long time. Yeah, we're going to take a little bit of a hit, but but we, we don't need money. We can manage that and we'll get through that. So number one, we are not looking for a bailout on the pension fund, as apparently some other states were. Number two, the state did have a budget gap and the budget that was put together you know, largely address the gap short term. You know, I think the problem, and, and I've certainly identified this in all of our budget reports, and 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 you know this, Mark, because you, you you you've been speaking a lot about state issues in recent time. <laughs> we we start every budget year with a with a with a structural budget gap, and like we're always playing catch up. And fortunately, because of the strength of the New York economy, we always figure out how to how to get through a, a budget year. But we haven't had the kind of long term budget balance that we should have. But you know, to your point, what we're really looking for now uh, is money to plug the hole that's created by the drain on the government revenues because of the, of, of the, the pandemic, and certainly reimbursement for the, for the direct direct costs as well. It is not to help with our with our fiscal uh, any fiscal issues in terms of out year budget caps. And even when you look, you know, at the numbers, I think at the beginning of the year the out year gaps were, I think about seven billion, eight billion dollars projected over the next few years. I mean, you know, the real the real outlier number was closer to to uh, it was like th I think 68 billion. So with the kind of steps that we would normally take to, to start to control the gaps, that's where we get that 25 to 26 billion dollar out year uh, number. But what we're talking about is that is the damage to the economy by extension to the revenues coming to the state that need to be dealt with. That has nothing to do with 
with budget choices that other people would have made or fiscal mismanagement or anything like that. So this is not an attempt to mask other issues. Uh, this is really an attempt to just deal with what the, what the crisis triggered. Again, it doesn't mean that there weren't issues to deal with. I mentioned the Medicaid you know, cuts and reimbursement. That is something that's being implemented as part of the Medicaid redesign team recommendations, because if you remember pre-pandemic, there was a problem with, with uh, spending costs uh, coming in higher than anticipated on Medicaid and a need to control some of those costs. So, so you know, the state was already dealing with some of the issues that, that had to be dealt with to get the budget done. And then, you know, the other challenge, I'll just mention this to close out the point, you know, not only were we taken by such surprise by this public health challenge, it all happened so fast. You know, people are you know, con comparing to the Great Depression and, and certainly the 14.7% unemployment rate was even higher during the Great Depression. But the Great Depression happened over a period of a long period of time. It was a terrible time, but, but this happened overnight. You know, the loss of jobs, the, you know, the shutdown of the economy, we have never experienced anything like this. So any notion that the economic damage and the revenue damage to the state is masking, uh, you know, some underlying uh, issue, it's just not true. You know, we, we want to deal with, with the crisis that's been brought on by the pandemic. You know, so that point, Tom, and, and, and uh, you have a terrific uh, and, and very deep professional office. Um, I do, I think you know we're required to say Matt Martini three times uh, during every... Uh, well, you could do two, that's, you know. That's, uh, but uh, to that point, uh, this, and, and there's some dialogue about it. So um, the question of what a recovery might look like, because un unlike the Great Depression, which, which the decline was over a longer period of time, the, 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 re the recovery was over a period of time, of course, benefited uh, to a great degree by President Roosevelt's willingness to spend a lot of money. Um, and, and I'm the first to uh, defend uh, the Dutchess County president. Um, and then, of course, to some extent, the, ex the spending from World War II, uh, it, you know, sort of yeah. accelerated that. There's this concept of uh, a U versus a V recovery. What what does uh, meaning, you know, uh, uh, down it defined plateau and then and, and then slow uh, incline for, for a U or steep decline, steep incline as a V? What what do those who forecast things in, in your office and what do you think uh, the recovery might look like? Yeah. Well. You know, apropos to your earlier comment, you, you get what you pay for, right? So I'll give you the free free economic advice. Look, I, I think we're in such uncharted territory that anybody that predicts anything, it, it's certainly not with certainty. Um, you know, my, my sense from everything I'm hearing, uh, and I guess intuition, if I could put it that way, is that it's not going to be a V. Uh, it, it, so that will probably mean a U. My worry is that, it, that it's a W, right? Is that we, you know, we start to come out of it, and then if there's a reinfection, we go back down again and, and have to shut things down. So that's why that issue at the front end of, of doing the reopening and having business in, back in action again in a safe way, so we don't have a reinfection in, in the fall when you know the flu season starts again and and colder weather that might contribute to, to more people uh, being affected by COVID becomes very very important. Uh, you know, I. There's a lot that doesn't make sense to me now. Look, I, I, I'm not unhappy that the stock market is doing well because Wall Street doing well helps the rest of us in New York in many ways. Certainly for the pension fund, you know, our, our, our stocks seem to be bouncing back. The disconnect, though, for the markets doing well, you know, so Wall Street doing well on Main Street is hurting, uh, is a concern. The, the bigger companies being able to, to bounce back, I mean, you know, you know better than me, I'm sure. The small business sector really has been decimated by what we've been going through. How many of the small businesses in Dutchess County, uh, it's not even a question of when they'll reopen, will they reopen at all, ever? Can they? You know, uh, you think of, of the restaurants, the small retailers, and, and you know, the, the kind of, of, of optimism you're seeing in the stock market with some of the, you know, the big companies doing well, that, that to me is disconnected from what's happening in the neighborhoods in terms of real people uh, who may not be able to get back to the kinds of small businesses they owned or, or the small uh, businesses that they worked in. And, and, and that's where I think, you know, you could in fact see a very, very slow recovery. Where, where will those people, uh, you know, find employment then? Uh, you know, how will we uh, reimagine, reconfigure uh, workplaces? We're, you know, we're doing that. I'm sure you're doing it as well as we start to reopen. There are very few of us working in our building here in Albany and the, all the other offices are closed. But as we start to reopen, how many people could 
be in the building at a given time? How many people can be on an elevator? Do we have enough space to reconfigure um, work areas? How do we deal with that? And so let's say you're, 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 you have a small business, you have a retail shop, you have a, you have a local restaurant in, in Poughkeepsie. You know, if, if you can only have 50% capacity, can you even reopen and survive with that? So, you know, so from my perspective, even though there seems to be some good news in terms of, of the big, some of, some of the big players, not all, um, I'm really concerned about what's happening with the smaller businesses all across our state. Because at the end of the day, that still is the strength of, you know, of our economy, our small business sector. And uh, it, we really have to do all that we can uh, to make sure that they, first of all, survive and, and then thrive. I guess I am somewhat helpful as well. You know, the tech sector has grown significantly, particularly downstate. And that is a sector that, you know, folks might be easy, easier for them to work, continue to work remotely. You know, so continuing um, optimism as far as uh, the technology sector being a big part of, of our recovery. And I guess good news compared to 10 years ago, uh, banking and finance, you know, are not on their backs like they were 10 years ago. So again, that should be a bright spot as well. But, you know, I, I think it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a U. I'm hoping not for a W, but uh, it's, going to take, it's going to take time for us to, to get back to where we were. Yeah, we uh, we we will. And uh, so we uh, we've been working with the Dutchess County Regional Chamber of Commerce. I know you've spoken uh, before them many times, uh, has developed our business notification network. If you're watching today and you are a small business person, if you visit DutchessDNN.com, you can get daily updates on tools and resources that are available. Uh, we surveyed our businesses and, 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 and yeah, to your point, uh, we recognize and certainly all understand um, the, the, the challenge for the small business owner is, is just overwhelming. Uh, as much as we have to be vigilant in face, using face coverings and engaging in the physical distancing, uh, you know, we, we're encouraging people to be equally vigilant and if they can, if they have the resources to choose, spend their dollars with a local business. Um, they, they're going to need our help more than, more than anyone else. Um, so a couple questions. I don't think you, you or I can answer these specifically, but June and, and Chris were both uh, talking about the federal potential federal, uh, if we'll, we'll say bailout stimulus lifeline and, and, and what the results of uh, the governor's meeting was yesterday. Neither of us was in the Oval Office, so I don't know that we can say for certain. But why don't you talk, if you don't mind, uh, so the governor yesterday uh, and the day before kind of pivoted and in and, and, uh, and talking about federal aid. Yes, we need the federal assistance to, to, to overcome this uh, loss of revenue, but started talking, I think, appropriately about the federal government investing in infrastructure. What, what does that mean to the local economy? What does that mean to New York State's economy? And, and why might that be a good mix, aid, you know, unrestricted aid and, and a, a infrastructure investment? What, what's, your, what's your opinion of that? Yeah. No, I mean, I think the governor's made the case repeatedly, you know, in terms of the unrestricted aid, New York being the epicenter, New York being a net giver year after year to Washington versus what we get back. But I, I think the discussion on infrastructure uh, is motivated by a couple of things. First of all, many of us have been talking about this for a long time, yourself included, right? And you certainly see the need at the local level. Uh, you know, localities don't have enough money to, to pay for all the capital expenses and finance them. The state doesn't have enough money for our own projects, let alone helping the locals. So we, there's always been this tremendous need for more help out of Washington, that there'd be a partnership, that we do more when we can and doing it in a responsible way for public private partnerships. But again, it all requires more, uh, more public money uh, to, to get that infrastructure spending going. And, and, you know, as the governor indicated, it's been years that everybody's been talking about doing infrastructure, including, you know, President Trump. Uh, I think from the beginning of, you know, his tenure, he, he talked about infrastructure and uh, he's one that has a reputation of, of liking to build things. And it seemed to be the one area that that there was like bipartisan discussion. But because Washington is Washington, right? Not that we don't have our problems sometimes uh, in Albany, but it's been such a divided and partisan uh, uh, toxic environment down there for so long. This is one that should have been easy and they never got to. And I think the notion is that infrastructure spending should be an area of easy bipartisanship and it could, in the very short term, stimulate the local economies in terms of employment because the, the jobs tend to be well-paying jobs. You know, you need good people in the construction area, trained people. Uh, we have wonderful folks that work in the trades who know how to do that work. So in the short run, it, it gets people working. And, and in the longer run, certainly whatever shape your economy is in, 
putting aside the crisis we're going through, you need to have good infrastructure, whether that be transportation, environmental infrastructure, you know, water quality systems, you know, roads, bridges, highways, all, all of that. That is so tied to long-term uh, economic growth. Mass transit as well, I should mention that piece. So it makes sense short-term for creating jobs. It absolutely makes sense longer-term for sustained economic growth. And it is an area where, at least if you believe what everybody says, bipartisanship, you know, should be there. So I, I, I thought, you know, again, I, like you, I didn't get a call from either of them to <laughs> tell us how it went. But, um, you know, but, uh, you know, if that could be the, a signal that there'll be some bipartisanship there, I think it would be great. And we, look, New York's an older state, and we've made some progress on, on, on some of our infrastructure needs, but we have a long way to go. Uh, uh, yes, since everyone agrees, uh, uh, it's likely not to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the problem will be the details, right? How, how much and how do you apportion it? And, you know, but um, boy, if a crisis doesn't create the dynamic for what should really be an easy one, then I don't know. I don't know what will. No, you're uh, exactly. Uh, so uh, several supervisors and mayors throughout the county have asked, and um, uh, there are other local officials, um, in the context of um, potential cuts and to the point of infrastructure, um, uh, the state uh, looks like it's starting to slow down on its uh, uh, um, you know, distribution of uh, uh, highway improvement dollars and other, other aid. Uh, I mean, you see that as it processes through your office. What, what, what should they be prepared for at the moment? It does seem like this, the, the, I, I will say, I'm, I'm sort of fronting the question. I think I know the answer, yeah. but the, the, of course the state is taking action to, to slow the distribution of aid. Uh, to municipalities, and specifically, I'd also throw out there if you want to answer it. Um, Lauren asked uh, specifically about what what that looks like now for the school districts, from from well, your and from where you were in the assembly. You know both of those. Uh, yeah, people. yeah. Well, you know, on the school district piece, we, they just did a big uh, payout, so the school district money seems to be uh, flowing. I think that just was as of uh, uh, May twenty seventh, so that just happened. Uh, so the, the the four billion dollars school aid. Uh, payment uh, that was due was paid out at the end at uh, March, May, I'm sorry, May 27th, end of May was when it was expected. So if uh, your local districts haven't seen it yet, they should be seeing that soon. You know, I, I think we, you're, you're right. Uh, the questioners are right. We, we have seen in some areas uh, a slowdown of, of, of payments. I, I don't want to say it's across the board because it's not yet. Uh, and I don't want to say that there's been a clearly articulated policy on it because other than a few limited categories, uh, including some grants to cities uh, that the budget director articulated, I guess, about a week ago in a, in a, in a newspaper article. It wasn't even a part of a big uh, announcement. We haven't seen any across the board uh, hold up on payments. But, you know, look, if, if, um, if you're facing cuts, you know, as part of cash management is to slow down your payments a bit, that's not as bad as a cut. That being said, I, I think what's really happening is that uh, the administration is really waiting to see what happens with the federal aid. And, and, and the real question will be whether there will be more aid from Washington. How soon will it get here? And if it doesn't come, uh, slowing down of payments will be the least of our problems. You know, the governor again said the other day, you could see cuts to school districts and localities in the range of 20%. So, you know, that, that to me would be a, a very problematic scenario for many of our local governments to contend with. Uh, and it should, be avoided. it should be avoided, yeah. Fair enough. Uh, so we had we have a couple more questions come through, but uh, a comment that uh, they wanted us to share. Uh, Julie has wanted me to share that um, your elementary school teacher, Mrs. Wallach, very proud of you. <laughs> well, make sure Julie gives her mom my best. Mrs. Wallach, Sue Wallach, was my second grade teacher at Meadow Drive Elementary School, and and one of my favorite teachers, uh, and always uh, have her close in my heart. So let's do this uh, because we have questions about it and they come up often. It's not your area, but why, why not at least talk about it? Uh, in that context, um, you know, we get asked all the time, what is school going to look like in September? Uh, uh, what does Tom DiNapoli, the New Yorker, uh, have to say? Uh, 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 what, what should the students not necessarily look, look for, but give them some hope? What's the. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. What do you think? Uh, you're giving me a tall order there, Mark. You didn't, you didn't give I'm giving you an easy question because it's easy. It's easy to offer an opinion. Well, I'm not asking you to contradict anybody, but you know, no, I mean, all sitting there at home, when they want they want to have the experience with Mrs. Wallach. You had. You know, I, I think so important. Um, 
you know, and I, you know I'm, a, I'm a product of public schools. And, you know, as you mentioned, I was on a school board for 10 years. And I admire what our teachers, you know, are doing now with, you know, the virtual learning and, and all that. It's just not the same, though. And, and I, 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 you know, I don't think anybody could argue that it is. And maybe for, you know, college and university level, you know, to an extent there already was a movement to do more online and more virtual. And maybe for, you know, for the older uh, students, uh, some of this makes sense. You know, but certainly when you're talking about K through 12, uh, I think, you know, from my point of view, we've got to figure out how to get back to uh, the classroom experience. You know, that dynamic, you know, between a teacher and their students, that, you know, that chemistry that happens, that inspiration that happens, you, you can't do it, you know, through this kind of, a, it just doesn't, it doesn't work in the same way. And I appreciate even, you know, what parents and families are doing to help help their students with the uh, their studies, again, it's just not the same. You know, so here's the problem. How do we do it in a way that is safe for the students, but also for the staff people, right? For the teachers uh, and the other staff people. And we know, with, you know, early on with this crisis, the medical information seemed to be that, you know, that, that younger people were less likely to be uh, infected. And yet now we have this other issue of this syndrome, uh, I guess similar to Kawasaki syndrome, uh, that may not affect a huge number of, of youngsters, but when it does, that has devastating impact. So, you know, so I would say this, we, we need to understand as best as we can, you know, the science, uh, because certainly schools, if you're going to start to reopen them and have, have a lot of folks in them, you better be sure that you're doing all that you can to keep students and staff safe. But I'd like to think that there's a way for us in September, you know, to get back to that, you know, unique experience. It's bad enough some of the students lost out from March to June. Mm. Gee, I hate to think that they're gonna lose out from September to God knows when of the opportunity to be in a classroom again. And, and, and you know, I don't profess to have the complete answer as to how to do that, but you know, I think it would be in everyone's interest to make sure we do all that we can you know, for that to be the case. Do it safe. I can appreciate that, and it's a good time also. To, yeah, you rec recognize them, but the, the families that have been home. I mean, first teachers have been doing some amazing things uh, with the, the technology uh, and, and the limitations that provide, but also, um, you know, families. I can tell you my wife has been running a, a small military operation. <laughs> uh, that, that's an impressive thing to, to, to see. But, but you know, uh, the, the, many families have taken on the role of being teacher, uh, parent, referee, and everything else. So... It's an it's impressive, but it can't can't be the only way we educate our kids. Well, but I mean, the other piece too, which which is secondary, I think, to the education piece, is that if we want folks to be able to go back to work, for them not to have to worry about where their kids are during the day is another piece of this as well. Yeah. So again, I mean, safety first, public health first. When you talk about the schools, what's what's best for the kids and their education first. But we have to, have to recognize if 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 the students are still going to be home in September, October, November. For many folks, how can they go back to work? Yeah, no, certainly, and I especially if it's a single parent family. No question. Uh, so uh, I, I will say, and, and the governor's staff is aware of this. I've, I've been making a, uh, an important, I think, um, issue of making sure that we provide special education services and the need to be sure that that those uh, services through at least the summer and, and of course next year, uh, for many special education students, can't be technology only. There, there needs to be the connection with the speech and, and physical and occupational therapy. But um, uh, Lacey has asked the question specifically, what's being done, you know, for the for the special needs community. And I know that um, your office launched uh, an initiative a few years ago, not specific to COVID, but but what 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 could you offer uh, Lacey in response to the support that 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 the state has you have uh, offered for those with developmental disabilities? Well, uh, you know, the, first of all, thank you. You've always been uh, such an important advocate for those with special needs and, you know, the kind of innovative programs that you've uh, initiated there in Dutchess County, and I've said this before, really are a model for what uh, all of our county execs should be doing and encouraging. And, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. The technology has limitations for anyone, I think, especially for those uh, with special needs. Uh, you know, it's a real issue there. You know, in terms of our office, we, you know, we've been charged with, and you've been helpful in, in helping us get the word out on uh, the ABLE program which is an opportunity for uh, individuals with, uh, with special needs or you know, families who have someone in the family that uh, has a special need and uh, they're concerned about their long-term financial independence to be able to open up 
uh, these ABLE accounts. It's part of a national uh, program uh, that each state is authorized to implement. And the great thing about it is it provides an opportunity for savings, but more financial independence without in any way sacrificing uh, federal benefits, uh, SSI and federal benefits that you may be entitled to. So that information is also available on our website. And I would mention separate from the issue of direct services, you know, Mark, as you know, part of our accountability agenda, we've also been keeping a close eye on special ed providers, especially uh, some of the for-profit and even some of the not-for-profit providers that frankly have not been using their tax, the tax dollars they receive uh, to provide services to, to, to special ed and special need uh, students appropriately. And, and so we've been enhancing the oversight in that area as well. Uh, there's nothing worse. Uh, we've had some situations, as you know, where folks literally were stealing money uh, and we've, we've been holding them accountable. So, you know, it's part of our accountability agenda to look out for the needs of those with special needs and special ed, uh, but also in terms of providing a service, the ABLE accounts, and again, go to our website, click on the, the part about the ABLE program, uh, and, and that, I, you know, I think will be helpful to people. And if any of you are involved with the program, you know, in terms of, of, of uh, uh, especially a nonprofit that, that may be providing these kinds of services, if you have any contract issues or payment issues, that's another reason to be in touch with, uh, with my office and we could help with, uh, with that. And to Susie, if you're a uh, local or uh, in Dutchess County visiting, thinkdifferently.net is the is the link uh, for those services that are available here. If you don't live in Dutchess County and you happen to be watching this, thinkdifferently.net at least can give you some framework for the services that are generally available in, in your community. And it's a, it's a pretty it's an intuitive website. We encourage you to visit it. This is not your uh, your fund, but a couple questions ago, regarding Social Security and the, sort of the security of the Social Security. You want to. You want to opine on that to a degree? <laughs> <laughs> that definitely is not my wheelhouse. Uh, uh, but, but, but I'm at an age where I have the same question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm watching. I, I feel like you know, there are folks like you who are going to take my Social Security. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little bit of, it's one advantage of being a little older than you. Um, you know, I, I mean, I haven't looked, you know, of late at, at the financing. You know, Medicare and Social Security, you know, you, we often read the articles that say in X number of years, you know, the, the, you know they're going to be, running out of money. Look, the reality is, uh, thanks to uh, the Dutchess County president you mentioned earlier, you know, we have a program like Social Security, and we've never had a time where uh, it's not been appropriately funded. So even if we, you know, come up to a moment where um, there may be a challenge, I, I have every confidence that Social Security is not going to be one of the programs that uh, will not be saved and, and will, will not be rescued. You know, Medicare, um, you know, look, the, probably the most informed constituency out there are the 65 and over. And I know they keep a close eye on what, you know, Congress is doing as far as the Medicare program. You know, the reality is some of, some, one of the challenges with our pension fund, you know, we're all living a lot longer these days. So, you know, when Medicare first came in, uh, you know, people age 65, that was probably considered very much a senior citizen, you know, whereas now, People are, it's very routine for people to live well into their 90s. So the kinds of, and obviously in later years, uh, the, the, the medical expenses are much higher. Uh, so, you know, we do have issues that we have to look at on the efficiency of delivering services, making sure that Medicare is adequately funded. Um, you know, you, you and I are in Washington yet, but, uh, and Roosevelt, Roosevelt was only the, we have to say, the first Dutchess County president, Mark. Let's be clear. We didn't say he's the last. But, you know, I, 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 I still think Medicare, Social Security, at the end of the day, whether you're Republican or Democrat, you can't see those programs uh, run out of money. Too, too many people depend on it. And uh, I don't think the American people would put up with uh, with anything going amiss with those programs. I, I agree with you. Um, and I, I appreciate the early endorsement uh, for, <laughs> for my president. Um, uh, there was one uh, person who wanted me to ask uh, who you voted for for governor, but we'll pass on that one. Uh, <laughs> neither of us want to hear the answer. <laughs> I'm sure was, that I'm your I favorite think it was second. A, wait, I think it was an Italian name, as I recall. I, I recall, an Italian gentleman. <laughs> I always used to joke that I was the funny one. <laughs> uh, I am pretty sure that I am your fa your favorite second place uh, uh, vote getter. I know that. 
Uh, Tom, we're going to wrap up. I appreciate you spending time with us. Um, I was asked about a week ago. Uh, I was off. It was a totally off-guarded question. Just uh, as we uh, uh, get to reopening, uh, and we finally get to whatever the new normal looks like, what's the first thing you're going to do? And I, I said, I want to take my kid. Yeah, I know. I, I <laughs> my wife gave me a bit of a trim over the weekend, only because I, I, I was starting at Gray Tufts. And I didn't didn't like it. Um, but I said I want to bring my kids to see their my grand their grandparents. We've been yeah. so um, so. Why don't Why don't you close up today by and I and I know um, you know we, we've covered a lot of topics and there's a lot yeah. of serious stuff to talk about. But yeah. um, and, and certainly the challenges for families and businesses and farmers are real and, and I don't want to dismiss that in the least. But um, it's been a good conversation. I think the public could use a little bit of uh, uh, of, a, of a pep talk. What uh, what do you what do you want what do you want New Yorkers to hear from Tom DiNapoli uh, as uh, we enter this new this new day and this new phase of, of hopefully uh, restoring uh, a bit of uh, normalcy to sure people. sure well you know I think the, the good news is New Yorkers have responded to the crisis and to the challenge remarkably uh, despite the illness and despite the death and the fear out there uh, by and large we've listened to the to the good guidance. That's how we we're able to flatten the curve and see the hospitalizations down and the deaths down. Our, our healthcare system with all its challenges and fragmentation has responded. And uh, New York goes into this challenge with a very resilient and diversified economy. So as we start to open up, if we do it smartly, uh, I believe we can do it effectively. It's gonna take time, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll get through it. I, you know, I'm old enough to well remember how people felt uh, after 9-11. It seemed like the end of the world and we'd never be back to the way it was before. Uh, you know, downtown Manhattan was a ghost town. You know, my office in the city is down there and it's, it's more vibrant than it ever was. You think about the Great Recession and uh, the terrible impact that that had. And, and boy, did we come back stronger than ever in terms of employment and stock market and so on. Now this is a little different. You know, this came out of nowhere. It's a public health crisis. Uh, it's scary uh, at many levels, but we've seen families pull together. We've seen great local officials like you, you know, really spearheading the effort on the front line of, of keeping the community together. I think we've seen uh, in New York a tremendous amount of bipartisanship, nonpartisanship, and, and that's something that too often is in short supply. And I certainly, you know, point to our partnership as a good example of that and the partnership that you have with so many of your colleagues in the Hudson Valley, whatever party that they're in. And, 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 and Mark, to me, that is all the ingredients, you know, for us, in fact, to get through it. Um, it's a somber time. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And we'll, we'll talk about this time for the rest of our lives uh, with a bittersweet feeling about it. But I'm also confident that, that we have the strength as not just New Yorkers, but as Americans to get through this. Let's just stay calm. I know that's hard. You know, people are very on edge about a lot of things. Let's share ideas and thoughts. No one has the perfect solution or the crystal ball as to how we get out of this and how quickly, but, but we will get out of it. And, and certainly from where I sit, even though a lot of the numbers we put out right now are negative, all the ingredients are there for us to get back, if not to quite the way it was at the beginning of March, at least to a new normal that will be an inclusive and healthy one for all of us and, and our economy may look a little different. Some of our families may look a little different. Some of our communities may look a little different, but we will get through it and we will look back at this time and say, that was another example of the resilience of the people of New York, the people of the United States of America. And again, Mark, I wanna thank you and your team in Dutchess County for being part of the solution to how we get to that better day. Well, thank you, Tom, for saying that. And thanks uh, for your uh, partnership. And I, I do think it, it goes, it, it should be restated. Uh, you and I don't happen to share party affiliation, but uh, uh, I consider you uh, a friend, uh, and uh, I think uh, the public should be uh, comforted to know that, that uh, especially during this time, uh, all across New York State, folks uh, who might not share affiliation uh, do share one ideology, and that is that uh, we're, we are all in this together, and we all have to find a way uh, to lift ourselves back up again. So, Well, well said. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being a part today, uh, and thanks for the work you do. Have a good, have a good day, Tom. Stay, stay well. well, stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.